you. And again, just to remind that all the, the speakers who are listening that, that, again, we welcome your comments, but we are going to be pretty uh, rigid about the, uh, the, the time. And again, written materials are always uh, welcome. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, members of the committee. Dr. Rankin, Devin, Executive Director of the uh, Queenism Foundation. I spoke to you at the last the meeting. Uh, I'd like to point out for the record that uh, we believe Dr. Peterson provided uh, inaccurate, incomplete, and misleading evidence to this committee this morning. Uh, as some returning Peace Corps uh, volunteers will attest, uh, if we can get them to speak today, for most of the past 25 years, Peace Corps volunteers were not given a choice of drugs, they were not properly counseled, and they were not properly educated on what symptoms required mefloquine's immediate discontinuation. Dr. Peterson also uh, incorrectly suggested that since 2001, the safer drug Malarone has been commonly available. This is incorrect. Until 2013, this drug was commonly denied <coughs> by Peace Corps volunteers. Dr. Peterson also mischaracterizes the adverse event experience of mefloquine within the Peace Corps. Prodromal symptoms, meaning uh, those symptoms that the manufacturer states require the, the drug's immediate discontinuation, affect a sizable minority of users. Anxiety, for example, 4% depression 4%, and Dr. Peterson failed to address the gross discrepancy between the known incidence of these symptoms and the documented rate of discontinuation of mefloquine among Peace Corps volunteers. Dr. Peterson should have acknowledged that for much of the past 25 years, Peace Corps policy for the use of mefloquine systematically neglected the manufacturer and FDA's guidance for the safer use of the drug. And I would invite Dr. Peterson to perhaps clarify his statements in a written submission to the committee that we would take the opportunity to rebut if necessary. While we appreciate the testimony of uh, Dr. Thomas Brewer, we would also like to point out a potential conflict of interest, namely that Dr. Brewer has been involved in studies and publications uh, of tefenoquine, an 8 neoquinoline drug uh, recently licensed by um, the U.S. Uh, military's commercial partner that the U.S. military has itself said is more neurotoxic than mefloquine. Our group has consistently uh, highlighted the known uh, neurotoxic class effect of the 8 aminoquinoline class, and I would have hoped today to hear some similar evidence uh, from careful studies conducted from tefenoquine and uh, related drugs, but we did not uh, see that today. So while Dr. Brewer's um, comments on our missing neurotoxicity were interesting and I think informative, they're mostly irrelevant to the question at hand here, which, which is the long-term effects of mefloquine and related quinoline drugs, which is what prompted the VA to, to ask for this uh, study. So let's listen to those who have taken these drugs. Today, in this room, you will hear from several metro mefloquine veterans. You'll hear from Jim Lloyd, Cheryl Lander, and Bill Manofsky. Uh, these, these veterans all have objective evidence in their medical records uh, of brainstem dysfunction consistent with the drug's neurotoxicity. These veterans, who are a small fraction of those affected, have traveled at their own expense uh, from all over the United States on short notice to be with you here uh, today. Um, and their stories are but a few uh, of the stories that we could share with you. The Quinism Foundation has collected uh, medical records from dozens and dozens of similarly uh, affected uh, veterans. And I would propose that rather than waste time listening to irrelevant testimony, uh, listening to uh, our government agencies tell us how dangerous malaria is and how safe Methylquin is take time to listen to their stories. Invite them here. In, invite dozens and dozens of these veterans to share their stories, share their medical records uh, with you, study them as the FDA and other international drug regulators have done. Drug regulators who, on review of the medical records, concluded okay. that methylquin causes permanent uh, adverse effects. Our group would be pleased to work with the study committee to uh, identify uh, veterans with the most uh, informative studies. And again, we'd be happy to share those records uh, on request. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Cheryl Lander. Um, I spent 27 years in the uh, Armed Forces and I recently retired 
in October of last year. Um, I'm here today because I took Mepiquin in October of, or March through December of 2013. Um, when I started taking the Mepiquin, I immediately uh, just wrote off the things to be in a symptom of war. I'm in Afghanistan, I'm away from my family, you know, the anxiety and the things that, that go with those things. You know, when you leave your child and you're in a, in a strange environment. Um, but whenever I was given the Mepiquin, um, it was because I was allergic to the Doxy. So the first course of malaria prophylaxis was the Doxy. But um, once I took the Mepiquin, uh, the doctor told me, he's like, you may dream, you know, just, just push through it. You know, that's, you'll be all right. Um, over the course of the medicine, I had balance issues, you know, um, the anxiety, the depression, uh, the anger. Um, but I did not attribute any of these things to the drug. Again, it was a symptom of war. When I get home and get my life back, things will straighten out, you know, these things will go away once I find my normal again. Well, that's not what happened. What happened was I stopped taking methylquin. That's when things got really bad. The anxiety, the depression, the anger, the disequilibrium, it was like sped up a little bit. And I started going to the doctor and going to the doctor. I have 32 trips to sick call over these things. Uh, the memory loss, losing my words, uh, making up words. I've gotten really good at that. I'll say half a word. And, and, and another half of another word. There are two words that belong in the same sentence, but they don't go together, but I just married them, if that makes sense. Now, I know that, yes, old people, we do that too, you know. But um, not on the level that I experience these things. Um, my records are not in any study, no one's called me, no one's asked me. I have consistently asked my military doctors, have you heard of mefloquine? What about mefloquine? Could mefloquine be doing this? Well, here's you some pills, pills that don't work. They don't work because that what you're giving me the pills for is not what I have. I have methylquin toxicity. It's, it's, there, there's not a cure-all. There's no pill. There's the, the only thing that you can really do, and what I would like this committee to do, is to have the VA develop a path of care and a course of action for us. That's all we ask is you give us a path of care, which is what, which really is, 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 is what we deserve, is a path of care and a course of action. We're not asking for a magic pill. We're not asking for money. We're just asking for a course of, act, a course of action. Help me be healthy again. That's all I ask. And I thank y'all for listening to me. Y'all have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have to, again, uh, move on, but I appreciate you taking yes, your time and, and coming to speak to us today. Yes, sir. Thank you. James Lloyd. <coughs> <coughs> Here it is. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to speak today. 
Uh, I would like to apologize up front for my inability to articulate at times from the uh, written format. And I'm going to try to keep this brief as I know to run your time constraints. My name, is, as I said, is Jim Lloyd. Over 17 years ago, February 2002, at the start of the war in Afghanistan, I deployed from Fort Carson, Kentucky, with the 2nd Battalion, 19th Special Forces Group, to <coughs> K2 Karshikhanabad, Uzbekistan, en route to Forward Operating Base in Host Afghanistan. Two weeks prior to my deployment, as was required because you need a serum level of this, I was given a blister pack of mefloquine and told to begin taking this drug on a weekly basis. As an 18 Delta Special Forces medic, I also administered this drug to my team every Monday, and I ensured other teams under my care had their appropriate military prophylaxis. We would soon call it Manic Monday, as we nearly all developed problems from the drug. Many of the team members I had served with for over 20 years developed unusual sleep disturbances, including sleepwalking, nightmares, visit vivid dreams, and would continue as daytime hallucinations. Many become, became unusually aggressive. I was never told that we were to stop the drug when these symptoms occurred. Ultimately, our team sergeant major became so dysfunctional from similar symptoms, I took him off mefloquine and substituted with doxycycline. I had him taken out of the combat environment and returned to K2 in Uzbekistan, where he could perform administrative duties without the stress of combat. I myself suffered through nightmares and vivid dreams and had difficulty performing simple tasks, including difficulty reading. I had constant headaches. I also suffered significant changes in my mood and behaviors. When I returned home, these continued and ultimately led to a physical altercation with my spouse. And, sorry. And the realization that I needed help. Fortunately, I immediately sought mental health treatment and I was told that I suffered from PTSD. But there were some differences in what my therapist says he normally saw with his PTSD patients. One difference that I noticed was that I was very dizzy. For example, I found that if I would look over my right shoulder, I would experience a sensation of tumbling in space and would ultimately fall down. This became very problematic as I was an ultra runner. One day while running a trail in the wilderness, I took a 10 foot fall and dislocated my left elbow. In 2003, I happened upon a website that discussed the possible side effects of mefloquine and everything began to make sense. I ultimately met Commander Bill Minofsky and he assisted me in being seen by the director of the Naval Spatial Orientation Center, Dr. Hoffer, who confirmed after careful testing that I suffered from brainstem dysfunction from mefloquine toxicity. Specifically, I was diagnosed with a deficit in my vestibular cerebellar pathways. He also informed me that he had seen quite a bit of this and that these effects were due to the drug's neurotoxicity. I was ultimately forced out of the military on medical grounds with a formal diagnosis of vestibular ocular dysfunction secondary to mefloquine. Subsequent workup confirmed that my condition would likely deteriorate over time. During one set of vestibular testing, I suffered what was diagnosed as a seizure activity. To this day, I still suffer from <coughs> problems with central visual dysfunction. I continue to suffer regular disequilibrium and vertigo that have been attributed to a central or brainstem disorder. I also suffer emotional dysregulation and cognitive impairment, not fully attributable to PTSD. Fifteen years ago, I was promised that my case would be part of a study that would be published by the CDC and the Navy, but this never happened. To my knowledge, the details of my case have never appeared in the scientific literature. It took the FDA ten years after my brain stem damage had been reported for the agency to conclude that the drug caused permanent neurological effects similar to mine and to add a boxed warning to the drug. If only the U.S. military, FDA, had taken my case and others seriously and listened to Dr. Hopper and Commander Minofsky, that same warning could have been published 10 years earlier and the U.S. military could have deprioritized mefloquine in 2003, not 2013. Who knows how many soldiers could have been spared my fate if this had been done. As you conduct your literature review, make no mistake, the literature does not contain my story. The Quintism Foundation has all of my records and those of many more of my original cohort. I urge you to work with them to review and study my records and decide for yourself the extent of mefloquine and its neurotoxicity as to the cause of my disability and that of many of my team members. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to add just one more thing. 
What soldier in combat does not experience anxiety and depression? I would be worried about anybody that didn't. So I will leave that. And again, I thank the panel for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much um, thank for, you, for coming to speak to us. Today. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, as, you, as you've heard, my name is Jonathan Furman, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone here and thank the committee for uh, looking into this. I think it's a pretty serious issue. Uh, last time, last meeting, I, I spoke briefly, and my background is actually with quinolone antibiotics and not quinolone antimalarials, but they have such a common background and chemical composition, and it looks like the side effects are so similar. I'm tracking what's happening here uh, very closely. Uh, I want to give you all an update on <coughs> what's happened to me since the last meeting, which essentially was, I had a nine day episode that was basically a nine day long panic attack mixed with severe anxiety and insomnia. Prior to taking Cipro, I don't think I was able to understand what a panic attack would even mean. I haven't taken Cipro in seven years and this comes out of nowhere. You know, and I can't even go to work for nine days that bad. So I, I say this because it, it, it indicates the, the impact that a problem like this that's generated from a medication can have on your life. At any point in time, you can't do what you need to do. You can't go to work. It's going to interfere with all your relationships. This stuff is really bad news. In addition to that, over the past several weeks, I've talked to several veterans who have taken mefloquine and have very similar symptoms. They also, you know, have entire pieces of their lives now that are just missing. Destroyed relationships, employment problems, so on and so forth. So, you know, I'd like to keep, for you guys to keep the human dimension of this in mind because it is significant. Uh, two more uh, real brief comments here. Uh, earlier we heard it sounded to me like uh, an analysis of potential disability reports or medical evacuations due to drug reactions. I can tell you from firsthand experience that when these reactions occur, you get a misdiagnosis. You'll get diagnosed as having an anxiety disorder or, or depression. You'll be put on psych drugs to manage the symptoms, which are partially successful. You will not get, you know, advice that this is a serious situation that you're in. You will not get medevac out of wherever you are. You will not be routed to the disability office. The symptoms will be managed until, you know, something worse happens, uh, which can often take months or years. So the way that plays out is, is usually you see career problems. Another way it plays out is suicides. I think for both the quinolines and the quinolones, when these become fatality events, it's usually a suicide type situation. So uh, that, I'd, I'd like for you all to think about that. And the final thing is, is uh, the uh, early presentation on uh, mechanisms of neurotoxicity was a, was a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, the part at the end about mitochondrial toxicity, that is exactly one of our leading theories as to why quinolone antibiotics cause the neuropsychiatric problems, in addition to chronic fatigue. It's not just the central nervous system that's affected but you see it most profoundly there. And the research that's been done with the antibiotics, what we're finding it seems to be that there's genetic damage to mitochondrial DNA. So this is coming out as something that's nearly been proven. I'm hoping <coughs> someone is looking at similar things for the quinoline and And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you again for, uh, for coming to speak to the committee. <coughs> Next, we'll hear from Sarah Thompson, um, who's on Zoom. So, Sarah, we're going to unmute you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thank you for uh, calling on me. My name is Sarah Thompson, and I serve as a PhD for volunteer for Camp Faso, West Africa, 2010 to 2012. Contrary to CDC guidelines and recommendations, my anti-malarial medication was handed to me in a brown paper bag soon after my arrival in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. The medication was um, not provided to me while I was in the United States, even though Peace Corps provided training with other medical services, including vaccinations at the consulate in Philadelphia prior to departure. 
when I was handed my MEPLA claim soon after arrival in Africa, one of the Peace Corps staff to include the Peace Corps medical officers provided me with any information on the drug <coughs> adverse or for what symptoms I was um, discontinued the drug. All I was told was that my service would be paid if I were found to be on. And even though I was made to sign the document, which I stated I agreed to choose Mapleclin, Mapleclin was chosen. At the time, I did not know of, nor was I offered either of the two different options that should have been made available to me, doxycycline and, mal and malaria. I was also provided with a loaded dose of Mapleclin, and the Mapleclin was free to date upon immediate arrival in the country. While I was living in a small village in eastern Burkina Faso without running water or electricity, having little to no access to health care, I experienced several health issues and such effects effect that I learned were very likely caused from my use of methylene. Soon after starting methylene, I experienced insomnia, anxiety, depression, and paranoia. At the time, as a peace corps, I was to refill my medication despite my experience in reporting my psychiatric symptoms. I developed disabling birth dizziness and vertigo. Upon my return to the state, my symptoms worsened. Although I was assured by Peace Corps staff that I nearly had an ear infection that my symptoms would subside, I continued to experience unanticipated dizziness and vertigo. On several testing, I was found to have abnormal testicles and evidence physical nervous system. Thankfully, Dr. Nevis reviewed thoroughly read my medical file to identify my Over six years later, I continued to suffer from dizziness and vertigo symptoms. As Peace Corps provided me with the drug while I was outside of the United States, I was not able to hold or lie legally liable for my disability. This judge and D.C. dismissed the lawsuit that I filed against Peace Corps for three reasons. One of the main lack of jurisdiction, as the drug had been given to me while I was in Burkina Faso. I have three claims with the Department of Labor, two of them active. All three claims, numerous errors, and false information. I have called Department of Labor and advocated for my health care since my return. Despite over 100 meetings on the show <coughs> and many more discussions, 100 plus discussions for Department of Labor, I have been unable to hold Peace Corps or Department of Labor accountable. As such, I am unable to access appropriate medical care and treatment for my health issues that may be applicable to me. When the Wall Street Journal discovered my loss, against or and published a story about it, I received countless emails from people returned or volunteers regarding their struggle with applicant poisoning and resulting symptoms. Ranging from paranoia to I made a bit similar issues to suicidal ideation. I tried contacting the National Institute of Health to encourage them to conduct a study of individual volunteers like me. I even filed a whistleblower lawsuit to validate my experience of a as a as and the whistleblower lawsuit was dismissed that I am a regional volunteer and is not considered a federal employee. Beyond a false publication by the Wall Street Journal, my case has never been formally acknowledged or officially reviewed by Peace Corps or any other by several attempts to get access to appropriate medical care and treatment. Based on today's presentation by Mr. Peterson, Peace Corps is currently not compliant with recent legislation that has been successfully signed into law in October 2018, mandating that Peace Corps provide anti-malaria prophylaxis or CDC recommendations. So in other words, Peace Corps provides the, um, the fiscal training with the medication in the state. In other words, this legislation mandated that Peace Corps provide for training with anti-malarial um, prophylaxis in the state. In the bill is HR 2259, SAMFAR, and Capital Peace Corps Reform Bill of 28. It's been over six years since I returned to West Africa and I continue to experience the side effects of this drug. I know countless other volunteers who continue to struggle on a daily basis who are on disability which is constantly be attributed to this drug. I am offended and deeply disappointed by the Peace Force failure to hold themselves accountable for the consequences of their continued use and misuse of this drug. And I encourage the community to recognize the inadequacy of the current literature published evidence, which includes my experience and my talents of my fellow volunteers. I urge the committee to do what Dr. Nevin has done and carefully study my record. If you do this, I am confident you will conclude that my case represents the tip of a hidden epidemic of 
going on here. Suffering from the long term effects of methyl chloroquine, suffering from a disease called spinism. I'm more than happy to provide the text study in the format to anybody who's part of this. Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson, for the uh, for speaking to us today. Next, can we please hear from Aaron Mercer, also via Zoom? Um, you're being unmuted. Hello. Please go ahead, Ms. Mercer. Um, so I hear an echo from your computer. If you can please um, turn your mic off. I'm that one. Yeah. I could not understand anything there. We're, we're trying to improve it. Let's see if this helps. Okay, testing. I was a deaf education for a volunteer in Kenya. I was prescribed a mass at the beginning of my service in November of 2008. The only warning we received concerned paranoia bad dreams, depression, and anxiety. It seemed to be expected that we would stay on methylquin unless we had those side effects. I was never advised of the need to stop the drug at the onset of any other psychiatric symptoms. It is difficult to know when my anxiety, uneasiness, insecurity, and depression began. Of all the volunteers joked about meth so they were not taken seriously as a warning sign. I do remember having vivid dreams, but they were not necessarily nightmares. I did start trying to remember them and write them down, but I must have been. After several months of experiencing these symptoms, in September of 2009, I had a seizure during the night. I was evacuated to Nairobi for testing. I was returned to my site having this that my seizure was caused by an infection. I continued taking muscle quen. Two months later, the American Peace Corps doctor suggested that I go off of muscle quen and begin using Malro. I agreed because I'd begun to sleep with the light on and was concerned that I'd started to paranoia. After my seizure, I felt I never fully recovered from the experience. I continued to suffer from depression and paranoia, and I decided to return home in February of 2010. In June of 2011, I had a second full seizure. I saw a neurologist, and he informed me that despite the absence of family history or any signs in my personal life, I had epilepsy. Since my first seizure in Kenya, I've been experiencing moments of deja vu combined with nausea, dizziness, and odd smiles that I learned were partial feet. At this time, I still believe that these were due to an infection and acquired, acquired while in the Peace Corps and was successful in obtaining medical coverage on this face. Only recently I learned about the possibility that my seizures could instead be due to methylquin after I requested all of my medical records from Peace Corps I was shocked when I saw in the notes that my seizure had been described as possibly methylquin related during my time in the Nairobi hospital. I question why I was not given that information and immediately taken off the drug. We were never informed that, informed that the side effects of methylquin would last after we stopped using the drug and possibly forever. I continue to suffer from epilepsy. I also other issues such as vertigo, nystagmus, memory loss, fatigue, and an inability to focus. I continue to suffer from depression. I now believe that these are long-term effects of necklace. To my knowledge, the Peace Corps has not reported my complaint to the FDA. I have never received any formal acknowledgement from the Peace Corps that my disability would be the result of the misuse of I have never been a subject of any Peace for a survey or a study, and the Peace Corps has never contacted me asking to review my records. I believe I am one of the many returned Peace Corps volunteers for whom the adverse effects of this drug has been overlooked or misattributed. I am offering this committee the opportunity to review my records and make their own determination as to whether my 
Thank you very much, Ms. Mercer, for uh, speaking to us today. Um, we have several others. I just want to say that you know, we've got a number of other people signed up, and so uh, I think for the uh, to, to manage the time, we will we will continue through all those who have signed up either uh, via Zoom or, or in person, but uh, we won't be able to take any others to sign up uh, today. And again, we're always receptive to written materials. Uh, if for those who may have wished to speak who haven't signed up yet, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Marlene Espinosa, a PhD in Biomedical Science, and I have a specialty in drug discovery and development, and also in infection disease. I work for NIH in infection disease, in tuberculosis, uh, but also in public health, looking for what is happening with other diseases, including malaria. And I work in South Africa with malaria drug discovery. So uh, I also I can talk in a way uh, because I when I was in South Africa I traveled to Kenya and I took I took prophylaxis and nothing happened to me so I think I have a good story like not for everyone the drugs affect in the same way so I wanted to start this question and comments about the presentation talking about this because uh, when I hear everyone talking about uh, the drugs, for example, in the last presentation about artemisinin and adults, um, I feel like uh, we need new data. Uh, many of the data presented was 10 or 20 years ago, which is not the reality what is happening today. Uh, this is one of my, my suggestions probably to consider what is around the world in the new therapy we treat malaria because uh, many things is going on. For example, in South Africa, I was working with uh, with one of the group developed the first drug in clinical trials in in the African continent. So it's to see what is, what is going on as well. Um, other things uh, I missed in the presentation about the combination therapy, because we we know now is. Um, they are using currently is approved by CDC, FDA, CORTEM, which is also a combination of RD meter, which is also artemisinin and other with not only anti malaria drugs. But it, this was approved in 2009. So my question is is something new in the market right now that like we can use, or if it's not in the market, how far we are to, to get the, the new therapy? Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm wondering because of the, the side effects um, of the drugs, I want to mention the drug interaction because many of the people is not taking just drug for malaria, is taking drugs for an, another disease. So this also I miss in the study they present this morning. And finally, I want to mention about the cost because we know the the better drugs or with less side effects is more expensive. So if also try to see if there are some uh, a study, like for example, expression in bacteria to develop the, the drugs, like oh, some of the uh, current the development, like artemisinin is producing in Brazil because of the cane of sugar, uh, or for example, if is uh, doing some engineer with um, yeast or bacteria is, is low, lower the cost of the, the drug that produces less than side, side effect for the population. So yeah, this I wanted to, to finish, but I to consider these topics for the next presentations. Thank you, Dr. Espinosa, appreciate it. James Preach. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for your time. My name is Jim Preach, and I'm a retired special agent with the State Department's Diplomatic Security Service. Throughout my career as a special agent, I underwent annual mandatory comprehensive physical and psychological examinations to maintain my service eligibility as a special agent. 
When I retired in 2000 and went to work for the World Bank, I was in excellent physical condition with no prior history of psychological, neurological, or physical impurities until I took larium on back-to-back -back trips overseas. After my ninth pill, I became seriously ill and was medevaced to the Johns Hopkins Medical Center, where doctors treated me for a traumatic brain injury due to acute methylquin toxicity. This was 19 years ago. My, system, or my symptoms, which continued to manifest with increasing severity, included severe depression, major panic attacks. I couldn't look at a rolled up Washington Post without falling into a fetal ball. Acute insomnia. I couldn't sleep for more than two hours without, even with sleep aids, without being jolted awake. And my brain telling me, you're not getting back to sleep for another 36 hours. Intense cranial burning, epileptiform seizures that rendered me unconscious, severe aphasia, intense synaptic jolts, acute tinnitus, tinnitus severe imbalance. I used to have perfect imbalance when I practiced the martial arts throughout my life and could even do a tightrope walk. Now, to this day, if I stand with my feet together and close my eyes, I fall over backwards to the right. An inability to filter out any stimuli, loud noises and flashing lights literally shut down my brain. An overwhelming suicidal ideation. I could not believe how this other sense of me continued to say, get up, run as fast as you can, and jump out the nearest window or walk in front of that semi to end it all. And uncontrollable rage. Those of us who suffer from methylquine's uh, toxicity never know when these symptoms will cyclically return to us and which ones will return at any moment and for how long. To my good fortune, my graduate education and a lifetime of experiences serving in more than 150 countries worldwide, along with an amazing wife, a psychiatric social worker, who happened upon a website named Larian Action, Larian Action USA, allowed me to understand that it wasn't me. It was the methylquin that was devastating my life. Unfortunately, a, dump, a young GI or Marine just recently out of high school with no experiences and no support system, who also lacks any knowledge of the symptomology of methylquin, will not be so lucky. They will simply not know that it isn't them, and the result will be utter devastation. They will be examined by doctors who honestly tell them that there's nothing wrong with them. The 40 physicians of every specialty and ilk who examined me on behalf of the World Bank's insurance company told me that very same thing. There's nothing wrong with you. Why? Because they couldn't see the damage inside my brain. But a doctor who performed a six-hour functional electroencephalogram found otherwise. His 76-page report confirmed permanent damage to multiple areas of my brain. And when he hesitantly remarked that I no longer had any alpha waves in my frontal lobe, he fearfully said, quote, I'm honestly not sure why you haven't gone postal by now, end quote. Unfortunately, State Department Peace Corps employees and GI suffering from larian toxicity will not be offered such a functional EEG. They will be told that they are suffering from PTSD, a completely incorrect diagnosis, and they will often be told to man up and quit malingering. Often their only recourse is to give in to the symptoms of suicidal ideation and end their own lives, or give in to the symptom of uncontrollable rage and end someone else's. I'm sure that each of you has read the stories and articles that pertain to each category. While the FDA and CDC have not yet prohibited the use of methylquin as a prophylaxis, they need to. But more importantly, we need to accurately diagnose the brain injuries of these poor, unwitting government employees and GIs whose lives have been devastated by mefloquine and adequately treat them with every medical asset at our disposal for however long it takes. 
I am on permanent disability from the World Bank, and I remain on several brain medications to mitigate Mefloquine's devastating effects, and will be for the rest of my life. While with regard to my future, I fear that its effect on my brain in terms of synaptic failures may lead to dementia and Alzheimer's, but that's the future. Right now, I beg of you, please do something for those people who are suffering and prevent any more suffering in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mm -hmm. Can we please unmute Lloyd? <coughs> Hello. Hello, we can hear you. My name is Lloyd. You can. My name is Lloyd Juhan. Uh, I my journey with malaria malarium began in 1992 in Somalia. I was an infantry unit that was deployed there. We were given malaria on Mondays, and we. We joked about the fact that many of us had nightmares and things of that nature during that time frame. I know that I had I experienced significant anxiety, and that I was told I had heat stroke and dehydration, which was why I was dizzy all the time. I fainted on duty uh, several times, and was again told it was dehydration, even though I drank copious amounts of water all the time. Um, I had hallucinations while on duty. Um, we were on a patrol and I thought I saw a man on a camel following us. Uh, then I, I acquired tinnitus while I was in Somalia. And uh, then on, upon return, uh, I, I actually had malaria. And was uh, because apparently Nefliquin did not uh, deal with the with the, the malaria that was inside of the liver. So I I had to take a different medication after I returned home to deal with actually having malaria. Um, I, what Mr. Preach said earlier, I was that soldier. I was 18 years old when I joined. I had no idea that any of this was anything. I, I thought it was all me. I was separated from the military. I continued to have problems. I had a collapsed lung. Um, I had blisters that cover my lung, and my lungs had to be uh, ablated to the wall, chest wall, my chest. I continue to this day to have dizziness, anxiety attacks, and severe depression. In 2013, the VA said that I had unspecified anxiety disorder and then I was prescribed a Xanax uh, by an outside doctor that led to a suicide attempt uh, in 2016 and then the VA has since diagnosed me with PTSD panic disorder and major depressive disorder my PTSD was called non-responsive by my therapist and at that time, when I went doing my own Google searches, I discovered the research that was done by the Quinism Foundation and uh, Mr. Bill Manofsky and Dr. Nevin. And that was in 2017. And then when I reviewed the literature that they had available and the symptom list they had available, it described my experience in its entirety. So please, take this opportunity to review my records, which Dr. Nevin has, or all of our records that are available to you. We, this is the only way that you can actually see, because I know that there is no literature that involves my records. I did not know what I really had going on until just over a year ago. So please take a look at all the records. Please take a look at what every one of us have to say. And, and, and please move this forward so that VA can, can take care of us in the way that we need to be taken care of. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Duhon. Thank you for calling in. Uh, Christy Baca, you're being unmuted. Hello. We 
we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thanks for the choice. One second. Hi, my name is Christy Baca, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa in 1995. Um, Dr. Peterson's presentation this morning referenced survey of Peace Corps volunteers who served from 1995 to 2014. I'm curious what the selection criteria is that said about 8,000. Sorry, Ms. Baca, if you could speak just a little more loudly. Have a confirmed 
um, central vestibular disorder with damage to her brain system. So that was after a battery of uh, balance test. Um, um, he, he does a job. Um, forgive me. Um, so short-term memory, um, aphasia, so I don't know who referenced it earlier, but yeah, cow house is something I come up with when I can't find a word for barn. I just fill in the words in any way I can. Sometimes I have to just take someone something and point to it because I can't even navigate my, my way around to the word. Um, uh, sensitivity to light, sound, movement uh, continue to be severe problems. Rage is an issue. Um, I'm, I, I, I am disabled and I am struggling immensely. Um, uh, one of my more recent diagnoses was neuropathy. Um, and I have tinnitus as part of that as well. Um, Virgo balance issues, etc. Um, I don't know how to wrap this up, but I, I would like I would like it noted that since 1995, with an acute reaction to the drug, followed by medevac, followed by really just um, sensory issues, no balance issues at that time, no, no vertigo, no tinnitus, no depression, no anxiety, just um, motion issues. Um, it, was, it was 15 years. Um, when I had the severe problems, um, neurological um, symptoms emerging. And I, um, I reached out to a handful of Peace Corps volunteers that I had served with at that time, 15 years post, and, and asked them, how are you doing? And out of a very small number of people that I had served with, I had a large response of, I have epilepsy. I have, um, I can't remember the person that I met last week in a meeting at work and my wife was freaking out. Um, person after person um, with um, severe psychological issues or memory lapses. Um, that's it, thank you. I, I um, would be happy to make my medical records available and I appreciate your help. Thank you, Ms. Vacca. Thank you for, uh, for, for calling in. Suzanne Marmion, Marmion, sorry, you're, you're being unmuted. Yes, uh, Suzanne Marmion, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, thank you. I will be brief. Uh, in 2004, I was an editor at the BBC World Service and Public Radio International for Around the World. And I took mefloquine, um, and uh, I was healthy, including with no mental health history um, problems. Uh, I developed dizziness, panic attacks, brain fog, headache, and seizures. I was assessed and diagnosed by a neuroautologist with vestibular disorder due to methylene toxicity. And worth noting, I had taken three pills. Um, Fifteen years later, um, I do still have vestibular disorder, balance issues, headaches, and severe insomnia. Uh, my hope is with the committee today, and thank you uh, for the path forward for unsuspecting military and Peace Corps volunteer, volunteers in particular um, is that we're able to find a path towards sticking to safer alternatives. So thank you for deepening your research to ensure that there won't be future unnecessary casualties of anti-malarial drug neurotoxicity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marmia. And finally, can we please hear from Christopher Garudka? You're being unmuted. Hello, I should be on the um, My name is Chris Rudka. I'm a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel after 25 years in the Marine Corps. I took Larium in Afghanistan in 2007 and almost immediately um, began having vivid hallucinations, tinnitus, uh, a vestibular order disorder started, uh, anger issues, memory problems, vertigo migraines and I still to this day suffer from those things as well as severe life sensitivity, anxiety and panic disorder and I feel like it's getting worse. I struggled for decades trying to get the military to acknowledge what had happened. I was given these 
pills in a small bag at a small base called Camp Van in Afghanistan. And I, I'm very thankful to Dr. Nevin, who accepted a cold, cold call from me years ago, agreed to look at my record, to look at my post-deployment survey where I indicated that I had taken mefloquine despite it not being officially issued in my record. And with the letter he wrote in my medical records, um, helped me to, to at least get it acknowledged that there was something wrong. And while the VA has not officially acknowledged and won't acknowledge that my damage was due to mefloquine toxicity, that they still have acknowledged that there's unexplained problems that have caused my permanent total disability. And I, I just wanted to say to the, to the whole Academy of Science, to the panel, that I'm exceptionally grateful that there are advocates that recognize this issue and care about this because as many speakers have said, there are not advocates and most of the people, regardless of what capacity and organization they serve, are left to deal with the, the permanent and lasting impacts of this horrible drug and this disease without support from the organizations that, that caused this and made them take this drug. Uh, my final tour in the Marine Corps was as the commander of Wounded Warrior Battalion, and I made it a point to try to educate all of our clinicians, our doctors, our nurse case managers, and our VA reps the reality that most of the, the Marines and sailors that were coming to us as patients had symptoms that were unexplained and many were written off as PTS or TBIs, yet there were no TBIs in their records. <laughs> uh, but that was the, the pat answer. Instead of digging deeper into this and doing the required testing to acknowledge that there was this permanent brain stem damage <laughs> and the vestibular systems were permanently dysfunction and as long as there are people still talking about this as long as there are people still acknowledging that, uh, that we've done this to our, our fellow citizens and I, there's hope and I'm, I'm very grateful I am happy to make my medical records available and make any statements necessary and to be as an advocate uh, to help advance this cause the last comment I'd like to make is back to the data at the beginning of your brief about why mefloquine was given by Stockton as a daily, by weekly pill. When I was first given this pill, I was with a small team of six people, one of whom was a pilot, and he was told to not take the mefloquine because of the side effects and to take the doxycycline. But for the rest of us, the non-aviators that, that they didn't necessarily have um, you know, the need, so to speak, of, of having our, not having our vision impaired or those hallucinations, that for some reason that was okay. That acknowledgement that this drug did this to people from the very beginning is an indictment of it, it's, it's, uh, its impact. Um, and again, just thank you to everybody for acknowledging this problem and for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm happy to make myself available and my information public to advance this cause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rucha. Thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to us. We, we do have one more. Uh, Kander Billman Minowski. Yeah, excuse me, I'm not doing very well right now. Um, I just flew in from North Carolina this morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Bill Monoski. I'm a retired Navy commander. Uh, because this is recorded, I need to make it very clear that uh, I am here to protect the operational side of the military. Uh, I know many people on that side, and I want to make sure I'm not against them. Uh, in 2002, I was part of a 10 man team that were issued mefloquine for the deployment to the Middle East. I was given six blister packs of rapid rubber band and no boxer product insert. I was not given any warnings about possible side effects. I was not told to stop taking the drug if I experienced any side effects. 
prior to the deployment, I was healthy and fit for duty. I just passed my annual flight physical. I also had a top secret SCI security clearance. Uh, people with security clearances are very reluctant to admit anxiety or depression, so your data is skewed. A month into the deployment, I was reassigned to Special Forces Intelligence where I performed mission planning for the insert SEAL, Army, and Air Force Special Forces teams into Baghdad and Southern Iraq at the start of the Iraq War. And there I was on a hallucinogen. After I began taking the drug, I experienced anxiety, anger, and rage that transitioned into acute paranoia. I did not have the vivid dreams because I had insomnia and was working 20 hour days seven days a week. I also experienced about a debilitating flicker vertigo accompanied by panic during a nightlife fire exercise in the Kuwait desert. When I returned to the States, my symptoms of anxiety and panic attacks amplified significantly when I was issued Robitussin with codeine for a cough that I developed. Uh, so the uh, counter in indication whether the drugs does need to be studied, especially opiate narcotics, because of the use of uh, uh, opiates as painkillers in combat scenarios. I was admitted to the local emergency room five times for acute panic attacks. My wife said I tried to jump from a moving vehicle. I had audio hallucinations. The Navy doctors did not want me to talk about the drug. When I asked the clinic doctor if it could be the larynx that made me so ill, he told me that he did not want me to talk about it because it was too controversial. I later caught him generating two sets of medical records on me. When I went to seek independent medical care, I was diagnosed with eighth cranial nerve neuropathy by the ENT Department of Legacy Health Center, Portland, Oregon. I was also diagnosed by two independent neurooptometrists with central vestibulopathy, particularly conversion disorder, which I've heard before here. When the Navy was presented with these findings, I was then sent to Balboa Naval Hospital where I was diagnosed with central vestibular neuropathy from larynx toxicity. I was labeled permanently disabled by the, both the Navy and the VA and awarded disability benefits by the Navy and the VA for my neurological conditions related to larium mefloquine. I consider, continue, continue to suffer these disabilities to this day. Uh, when I was bad, I stuttered. I took two, it took me a year to teach myself how to talk again, so it's coming back today. That was 15 years ago. Four members of my deployment team were also diagnosed with central vestibular neuropathy from mefloquine poisoning by Dr. Michael Hoffer at U.S. Naval Hospital Balboa, same as Jim Lloyd. For a condition that was supposedly rare, having four members of my team develop similar brainstem problems should have seemed odd to the Navy and the CDC, who claimed they would investigate and publish on this cluster, but nothing came of this. You'd think they would have done a safety stand down after they diagnosed 15 of us, but they kept giving the drug out. Particularly if somebody is medevaced by helicopter, you would think you would stop giving it out. Okay? But you kept giving it out. But nothing came of this in the 15 years since and in the absence of the DOD or VA taking action on this issue, I assisted over 200 me 290 methylquine victims, veterans, victims seek proper medical care from vestibular balance centers and neurooptometrists across the country. <coughs> the common thread we see in these cases is central vestibular and central visual dysfunction. Despite having been known to the U.S. military and the CD since 2003, my case has never been published by these organizations, and this is not part of the literature, my medical records, and the records of many others, including some of the over 290 other sisters are available through the Quinism Foundation. I urge the committee to do as the FDA and other drug regulators have done and review these medical records directly to better understand the nature of long-term effects on the drug. Uh, most of these medical records were submitted to the FDA through their MedWatch program. So they have a database. Uh, one last thing, uh, it is my personal experience that uh, the cure for this condition is extreme physical therapy. It needs to be treated as if it were a spinal cord injury. It's, it, is, it is malpractice to diagnose it mal PTSD and drug people to where they are uh, non ambulatory in front of the, on a couch where they should be outside uh, playing basketball, playing racquetball, and recovering. 
so please uh, uh, have the VA do the proper testing, which they have not done. We told them how to do it, and they're not doing it. And also, uh, if the VA is worried about malingerers, you can't fake the nystagmus when they do the Dix Hall pipe maneuver. Um, and you cannot trip up the CDP machine. Computerized dynamic posturography, it detects voluntary movements so that malingerers can easily be weeded out there. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, that brings the, the comments to a close. Let me just, a couple of things before we, uh, we wrap up here. First, to uh, thank... Uh,